And so what I'll do today, I'll start with why studying early Earth environments is important. Just give you a brief idea of all the different research strands that I've been involved with. But I'll focus mainly on the Boring Billion, the idea that I had to come up with just before my 2015 Royal Society Winter Lecture Series talk, and then another idea to share. Now, if you forget everything I've told you today, because I'll cover a lot, and you just remember the last bit, I'll be very happy. Because I'd like to uh, tell you in three years' time how far I went with my idea. So why is uh, studying early Earth environments important? I've just started le lecturing at the university, and really to ensure that our students understand why geology as a whole is, is a really important subject but also early Earth, where that fits in in the whole um, broader aspects of geoscience. You hear a lot about climate change, and we've got to do this to have a more sustainable future. Well, you can't do that without geoscience. And more importantly, we definitely cannot do that without all the knowledge that we need to have of our past. Because in order to be able to predict the future, you need to know what's happened in the past, and then relate that with how things are evolving in present, and then using a combination of the information from the past and the, and the present, you are then able to predict a range of scenarios. So you might ask, why is it important to know what happened 1,800 a million years ago? Well, that all ties in to the whole story of Earth evolution. And really, past is the key to the future. You have to know how the Earth has evolved to see where it's evolving to the next stage. It's incredibly important, but it's not easy. It's, it's very complex, and much of our research is to solve that complexity, to see if we can get meaning out of the rocks that we look at. So here's a very brief um, geological timeline. I think I've got Prof here in the audience with me who will vehemently argue against the GOE1 and GOE2 because we all have our set views of when the Earth experienced its first oxygenation event. And there's a, it's a very controversial topic. But this is just the generic timeline. So I'm very sure most of you already know that the Earth is 4.56 billion years old. And we've got a lot of history to unpack. So a lot of ancient Earth or early Earth environments, it's about understanding how Earth has evolved from 4.56 billion years to today. And when I say it's, it's a very simple timeline there, but there are lots of different time scales that we're looking at. Some processes occur in order of billions of years. Some occur in seconds and minutes. Some occur over tens of thousands of years. And so there are these Earth system processes that occur in different time scales, and it's understanding how these processes in these different time scales eventually uh, combine to produce what we see today. And much of the evolution side of things that we all love talking about is the, is the macroscopic stuff, big dinosaurs or fossils that you can see with the naked eye. There's this extreme human fascination of finding something that you can see with the naked eye, and somehow that's very important. But much of Earth's history has a very significant microbial evolution. And so a lot of our early Earth studies allow us to look into those microbial worlds that continue, continually go unnoticed because they can't be seen with the naked eye and somehow they're not important enough, but they have been uh, throughout Earth's history. And so, again, understanding early Earth helps with this different micro worlds that exist within us today. I mean, there's more microbes on your face right now than the number of people in India and China. That's how prevalent they are. And their evolutionary journey has been Amazing, as amazing, or probably even more than the macroscopic animals. And so here are some of the time scales that I was talking to you before. You can read them, or I could demonstrate to you what I mean. Is that some cycles occur over billions of years, or millions of years, and that's the more first order cycle. Then you've got second order cycles that probably occur less than uh, millions of years. And then if you keep zooming in, 
you get your fourth order cycles and fifth order cycles as well. And so there are these processes that happen on our Earth in these various different time scales. And if we are to use the information to predict what's coming with climate change, you need all that that's happened in the past already. So that's where early Earth fits in. It's an account of what has happened in the past. And so basically we've got model data. There's computer softwares where you completely disregard early Earth environments and just use computer models. Or you could have rock data, the stuff that Prof and I do is look at the rocks itself and then gain information out of it, and we call it the rock data. And it's really a combination of modeling of present and past rock data that will give us the answer to the, to the future, which, by the way, I don't have for you on the Sunday afternoon. You really didn't expect me to give you an answer, did you? I don't think it's possible. However, I will have a smiley face because I'd like to be positive. But I am positive about the fact that the more we look at our rocks, the more we collect information about our past, it will enable us to predict future scenarios. And geoscience in general has a big role to play. And I will take this opportunity to highlight that quite often geologists get the bad name um, with climate change. But no, geology does have a huge role to play. And the fact that it's absolutely fascinating. Now, here's an example. We've got, um, here's a pyrite framboid that's 1,600 million years old. And here's something that's being formed in the, in the Derwent estuary today. So you see similar rocks, and you can gain information out of these compositionally. I work on pyrites, but other researchers would work on other minerals in different sediments. But essentially, the idea is that you see similar textures in something that's so old, and you see the same texture in something so recent, and you're able to compare how things have evolved through time. It's an extremely powerful approach, if you think of it. And, you know, I haven't signed up an application with Captain Picard that will take me back in time. These are my uh, means of looking back in time, just looking at the rocks and the data that I can get out of these rocks. And if um, some of you are wondering what the micrometer or what this um, sign means or how small it is, I've got a scale for you. This is how small a micrometer is. The other reason why we need to do early Earth is because to have a sustainable future, especially the one we talk about a lot today, is a zero carbon economy. To get from carbon economy to a zero carbon economy, we need a lot of natural resources, green metals. And to understand how ore deposits or economic mineral deposits have formed um, through Earth's history is valuable information for all of us, because we need those natural resources for us to be able to make the transition from a very carbon-focused economy to an, a zero-carbon economy. And so early Earth environment research fits into that as well. And so we've used um, natural resources in the past for all sorts of reasons. You can read through this uh, before. This is a picture from uh, Udaipur in, in India, one of the earliest zinc mine works. And it was used for different purposes. Uh, in the present, we are using um, it for different purposes. They will always have a purpose. Natural resources will always have a purpose. And understanding where these old deposits have formed through Earth's history is very valuable. And early Earth research helps you with that. And of course, in future, as I've mentioned to you before, we need these metals. I particularly work on certain type of ore deposits, focusing on zinc, but it's true for every other natural resource, resources that's required for the transition um, from a carbon-based to a non-carbon-based economy. Here's another research that I've been involved with, and I'm very thrilled to share this information with you. You can look at the rocks and understand their composition and then be able to use that information to detect signs of life elsewhere. It's, again, extremely powerful to be able to do that. Because you find these really small structures in your rock. And they may be a biological organism, but through time they get replaced by a mineral. 
But however, even in that replacement, it can still store critical information. And it's just about using the right technique to understand that information and see whether something is biological or not. To give you an example, here's a rock outcrop. You're looking at something that's, you know, thousands of um, microns. And then you've got pyritized ammonites. It's a mount, it's a rock that's been mounted. And you can see that the ammonite, which is a fossil, has been completely replaced by the mineral pyrite. Now, all its organism biological parts are completely remineralized, meaning the original material is gone. However, the texture is retained when that material was replaced by pyrite. And so if you put on your backscattered electron imaging, which is a type of technique, that's what the ammonite will look like. And you can see that it looks very different to what you can see with the naked eye. And if you further zoom in, then you can start to see some detail. And when you do that, you even see more details when you're at tens of microns level. So this is the fascinating bit I was talking to you about, to travel from something that's thousands of micrometers to something that's tens of micrometers. It's the techniques that's available to us today that allows you to um, travel through these different um, journeys or, or microscopic scale here. And even though this is completely replaced by the mineral pyrite, you can still see some primitive primary structures still being retained. Now, there could be things like that elsewhere outside of Earth, and if we can establish this technique, then it can be very useful to look for life elsewhere. Same thing here, if you put the same LAICPMS glass on, now that's a different type of technique, of a part of the ammonite that I showed you. This is what it will look like. And I'm showing you compositional imaging. You, you've got an organism. It's completely been replaced by pyrite. And now you've got um, element composition of what that pyrite is made of. And then you can select bits that you think that are biological versus non-biological. And when it's biological, you see clustering. It's a statistical way of analyzing which parts are biological and which parts aren't. And so you can see here that when you see significant clustering, meaning when the black line is above the gray shaded line, it's biological. And when it's within the shaded region, it's not. And again, so you're using these techniques to look back into something that was formed millions of years ago has completely been replaced by something else, but the structures are still retained. And somehow we are able to tell whether it's biological or not. And so there are these, you know, plenty of these microstructures that are here on Earth or elsewhere. I mean, Mars Rover 2020's uh, prime objective is to look for signs of life elsewhere. How are we going to do it if the primary material isn't preserved and it's completely replaced by another mineral? These techniques help with that. So that's another reason why early Earth is really important. So coming back to the, to the boring billion story, here's the timeline again. And this part is very infamous, and it's known as, as the boring billion. And all blame goes to late Professor Martin Brazier. I don't think he even realized the consequences of calling something boring. I mean, it's... It's unimaginable to think that a billion years in Earth's history will be something non-dynamic and boring. However, I have to say this term happens to be extremely catchy because quite often you just talk to people about the boring, oh, I want to know why it's the boring billion. Well, it was coined boring billion because I think we have different views of how we interpret things. And like I said, it's a, to give you an example, when, a, when someone is, is pregnant and they have a baby, it's the, the celebration comes when the baby arrives. There's no celebration when, during the pregnancy. Everyone makes a big deal about the baby in the end, but the baby would not have formed if someone didn't go through the pregnancy. So it's like having this big deal about macroscopic life forms and everything before that is boring. No, it's not. That's when the real fundamentals of evolution were being established. Yes, it doesn't look happening, but when it's delivered, you wouldn't have uh, the macroscopic evolution that you see on Earth today if those fundamental biological events, evolutionary events, didn't occur back in time. So we get that 
time span gets called boring a lot because there's very little notice of what goes on in our microbial world. And that's because we can't see it. So we don't think it's diverse enough. But here's a snapshot at the Harvard Museum. You can see this is microbial diversity, this sphere here, the circle. And this is how it compares to animal and plant diversity. We are a mere dot when it compares to what the microbial life is. And that's with 99% still yet to be discovered. So you just have to imagine how diverse the microbial sphere is and how and why it has basically dominated the evolutionary chain for a good part of Earth's history. And they're incredibly significant. And, but like I said, microbial world doesn't get much notice and hence anything before macroscopic evolution was thought to be boring. And the other common problem with humans is everything has to be human-centric. Or was there oxygen in the atmosphere? If it wasn't, then there must not have been any life because we use oxygen so others will obviously need oxygen to know. A lot of organisms do not require oxygen at all. In fact, a lot of the oxygen comes from certain organisms today. 50% of the world's oxygen today comes from the ocean's phytoplankton. So there are organisms that not only not require oxygen, but in, instead produce oxygen for the rest of us. So a lot of the times it was thought that that period was boring because, oh, there must have been lack of oxygen. So yeah, stalled evolution, because if you don't have oxygen, you can't have evolution. The problem is that you can have all the oxygen in the world, but if you're not fed well, no matter how much oxygen you have, you will not survive. And it's the same with a lot of other organisms. That you need a series of elements um, to keep you um, growing and, and sustaining your lives and you know, go about your normal lives. But it's also true for other organisms. You need a suite of elements um, for uh, growth and sustenance. Here's some examples and some papers that um, further um, suggest and confirm what I just said about organisms not requiring oxygen. And these are complex organisms not requiring oxygen at all. So much of the past theories were based on there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, so evolution must have stalled. You can't see big fossils in the rock record. There might not have been any evolution. So that period must have been incredibly boring. But there are some milestones. I mean, you and I wouldn't be sitting here in this room today if it wasn't for the prokaryote to eukaryote transition, the transition of a very simple cell that Eric was referring to earlier to a very complex one, 34 trillion of which you and I are made of. Multicellularity, you and I are multicellular organisms, and of course, the origins of sexual reproduction. These three were very key events in our Earth's biological history that occurred millions and millions of years ago, during the Boring Billion. Now, you can't see big fossils, but that's because these fundamental early biological events were occurring at the time. And with advent of new technology, people are discovering more and more fossil evidence of these events. You can see these very complex structures. Uh, don't, uh, probably not a good idea to go into the detail, but I just wanted to show you that there's lots of evidence today than what Martin Bracier had in 1998 that evolution was actually occurring during the Boring Billion. Here's another paper that talks about organism motility 2.1 billion years ago. So we start off thinking but science is, that's a beautiful aspect of science. It keeps evolving as we get more and more data. And so coming back to the Earth's timeline, if I were to, were to plot all those evolutionary events, here's what it would look like. So it's very wrong to say nothing happened during the boring billion period. But maybe at the time, Martin Brazier didn't have enough information. But today we do have. So now to think, well, if there was lack of oxygen, then why are we having these evolutionary events? And so for that, we need to look into elements other than oxygen. And that's where my research fits in. I'm able to look at elements other than just oxygen to understand evolution of life. 
And you might ask why. Why other than uh, I've just told you oxygen is not the most important element. But with elements such as trace elements in particular, major elements are also very important, but they've been quite, quite abundant in, in the oceans throughout time. But with trace elements, they, they fluctuate. Their quantity fluctuate. Even with you and me, you, you can't have too much of it, you can't have too little of it. And so the critical concentration of certain trace elements and their fluctuation through time has been critical in driving uh, the shape of, of evolution. And apart from basic cellular functions, it's uh, you and I, the chemical reactions that keep us alive right now, um, they are very, very important. They are extremely complex. And it's a great chart for a Sunday afternoon to get our heads around, isn't it? Um, I'm sure you're able to tell what the hell is going on. But um, in reality, all the reason I put it in there is just to show you the amount of work that goes into a single cell to keep it going. And in order for all of these reactions that are interlinked to occur, you need trace elements because they make sure that these reactions occur at the rate at which it needs to because we haven't got all time on Earth. We don't live for millions of years. So these reactions are critically important. And so un to understand what trace element fluctuations will have been like in the past, is critically important. And so how do I do that? Here's another rock outcrop, just to give you an example. It's a close-up of that. You collect your rocks. I've collected about 1,000 so far. Look for the pyrite. Now, I look at pyrite, but other researchers may look at other uh, minerals in, this, in the rock and uh, d devise their own proxies. Or, yeah. And so you can then mount your rocks into, into these little circular um, mounts, as we call them, or, or laser mounts. And then we have a look at it under the microscope, look at the textures. Not every pyrite that you find in the rock is going to be useful um, for all sorts of uh, chemical evolution history. It's very important what we do under the microscope, really, a, a bit more complex than what she's been doing. But really, what we look at is uh, we look for pyrites. And like I've just shown you here, they occur in all shapes and size, but not all of them are useful. So critically important to choose the right ones. And then we use this machine to give us the information we need. And I choose pyrite to work on early Earth research because pyrite is an excellent mineral to absorb the trace elements um, that is around that pyrite when it was forming. So millions of millions of years ago, when you've got your ocean muds, you will form pyrite in them. And those pyrites are excellent proxies for basically recording whatever the water column at the time was like. So whatever the water chemistry was like at the time, the information is being recorded by the mineral very efficiently. And it's stored for millions of years. And so when I analyze my pyrite using the machine, what I'm basically doing is to try and see its composition because it gives me the idea of what the composition of the oceans might have been like when it formed in that environment. And so if you want to know what actually happens inside the machine, which is called the laser machine, that's a pretty accurate um, representation of what goes on inside the machine, I'd say. It's a, it's a good visual imagination of what actually happens. There's me and Prof. We are just blasting our pyrites for all the right reasons. And what for? So we can create complex graphs like this and, and bore you on a Sunday afternoon. No, please just don't feel very, um, I hope it's, I know it looks complex, but it isn't. Um, on your y-axis here, you've got your nutrient availability. Ignore PCA score and everything. Just focus on, on these elements here. We want to know what the combination of cobalt, nickel, zinc, molybdenum, selenium, and cadmium have been doing from 2,000 million years ago to 500. And I've highlighted the boring billion in this rectangle here. And what we noted was that during the early part of the boring billion, the elements, the element list here, went significantly low, below the critical level. 
significantly low. And then at around 1400, it increased, which is very different to what others had said in the past. They had said, oh, well, it was low all along, and so it's boring. Uh, no, it was low, in fact, significantly low in the first part of the boring billion, but increased in the second part of the boring billion. And that's where I, in 2015, I discussed with Prof and I said, maybe it's possible that this period that everyone keeps blaming, maybe that's the period we should be most grateful to. Because this decline in nutrients would have created some environmental stress. Now, why is that important? We know the first complex cell formed because of two reasons. There could be two reasons. Biologists can argue about that, how it formed, whether one cell engulfed the other cell, or it was a symbiotic relationship where one cell, if, you, if you'll have me say, invited the other cell because of lack of resources. Now, whether one is being more predatory or whether one is being more friendly or endosymbiosis in biological terms, we can argue about that. But what would cause two cells to come into a decision like that or an interaction like that is the question I think um, our research is trying to answer. For a cell to ingest cells that are perfectly capable of living independently, why would they come together? is the question, and I think they came together because for the first time, they were being subjected to nutrient stress. In other words, there just wasn't enough of it around for everybody, and so the organisms at the time had to evolve. And so that's the stress hypothesis we had for the early part of the boring billion, and potentially the reason why we had the birth of the first complex cell. It was because two simple cells had to get into a symbiotic relationship to cope with the stress. And when nutrient conditions increased, uh, there was diversification, and you can see that in the rock record. It's, uh, you know, it's available um, in the microfossil record as well. And so this is an example that you see those predatory relationships today. This is amoeba um, sucking the guts out of, the, of green algae. Um, here's another video which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So we'll see if it works. But essentially, these tiny little uh, zoochlorella are being provided a, a, a safe environment by the bigger organism called paramecium. So these, these symbiotic relationships or predatory relationships were established a long time ago in the boring billion, and this is the cause of the first complex cell. And I think that nutrient low period contributed to that transition significantly. So what I've just said is essentially low trace elements, high trace elements, no pain, no gain. And it was during the boring billion period where you had to go through this environmental stress to get something better. And it's true for us even today. The amount of new business ideas that have come up in the last two years is incredible because of lockdowns and COVID. Yes, there were lots of issues with some businesses, but a lot of them had to find creative ways to somehow survive. And that is the very nature of things here. Um, again, another complicated looking thing to uh, scare you, no. Just focus on the colors. The red is high, yellow is medium, and the gray is low. Just giving you some idea about the work we do to look back millions of years ago gives you an idea about a suite of elements and the, what their availability has been like. And organisms have adapted to this availability or scarcity throughout time. So this is a, pub, a research that Prof and I published in geology, where we were able to demonstrate that as trace elements in the oceans have evolved through time, that has had a significant impact on the evolution of life through time. So very rightly, I now call it um, the brilliant billion, and I love doing so. <laughs> evolution, our understanding of it is evolving. No need to go into the details, just a list of things about how our perception of how evolution has occurred through time has changed. And that's because of advent of um, technology. 
And this is something you can read through after my presentation. But really what it shows is the more, the more we advance with our techniques and the more open mind we have, and that's something that was drilled into me right from my PhD. One of the first things that my supervisor said was, you are free to disagree with me any time. And that was very refreshing and liberating because you need that in science. Because as you have more technology, you will discover more information. And maybe I've told you all about the boring billion, maybe in three years' time, that theory will fall apart and I should be prepared for it. But I'm trying to say to you that things are understanding of how evolution has occurred. And I've used a strange term there, metazone, but uh, metazone just means animals. So big macroscopic animals that we love uh, looking at in the rocks. And so our understanding of the evolution has changed significantly. We're discovering more and more information, but currently we are at a stage where we are stuck where metazoan evolution started, because it's very convenient for a few researchers to say, yes, that's where it started, because it fits with our data very well. And you've got two options. You either accept that or you uh, deny it. And I have decided to deny it. And I'll tell you in three years' time if it's completely fallen apart. Proportion of stromatolite-bearing geological units, again, big words, but really what I mean is, how has the abundance of stromatolites through time changed? Don't know um, if stromatolites is a, is a common term, but I'm sure you will have seen stromatolites in Shark Bay in Australia, where you see these microbial um, sediments being formed in the water column. So these organisms grow towards light, and as they form, any suspended material in the water column gets trapped in the gelatinous substance that's released by these microbes. And so you form layer after layer after layer after these sediments called stromatolites. But essentially, it's the work of art by the microbial community. And it was these communities back in time that produced the oxygen that you and I take for granted today. Stromatolites, the oldest record of stromatolites is 3.2 billion years old. That's their prevalence in Earth's history has basically created the critical amount of oxygen, amongst other things, but they've been the primary drivers of oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, I'm trying to use their abundance through time, how stromatolite proportions in Earth's record have shifted, broad first order, and how that might shed light on when animals first appeared. Because currently, it's said that animals appeared 800 million years ago, and I disagree with it. Just another beautiful photograph, this, these, these microbial mats that you can see here, and this is a bubble of oxygen. And just imagine 3.2 billion years ago, nothing but stromatolites everywhere, just trying to get the atmosphere ready for, for the big shots, of course. So here's the trend. On your y-axis, you've got these dots. And what they mean is the abundance of stromatolites. High, as you go further up, um, is oh, the pointer. As you, so these are high abundances, and these are obviously low abundances. But there's a, a good record. Geologists have done a good job of documenting how stromatolites have evolved through time. This is very complex to uh, visualize right now. But you can see that there's been a first decrease in stromatolites, and I believe that's to, owing to do with prokaryotic competition. Then you've got a minor fluctuation in stromatolites, not much happening. Every now and then it increases and decreases, but it's at a lower level than what it was before. And that was a time when eukaryotes appeared in the rock record. This is a significant drop. This is a significant drop in the amount of stromatolites. And I attribute that to the diversification. If you remember when I showed you the boring billion curve, there was a bit when you, uh, the trace elements went up, and that's when eukaryotes diversified. Prokaryotes or stromatolites were no longer the only available community at the time. They were now starting to experience significant competition from eukaryotic communities. And then you see this rise. 
And this is when I think metazoans appeared. This is a time when there wasn't much oxygen for higher organisms, higher, bigger macroscopic organisms requiring more oxygen to fuel their cells. And this was the first evidence of microbial mats and tiny metazoans living in a, uh, in a coexisting mutual relationship because microbial mats produce oxygen. So it was in the favor of metazoans to let the uh, let the population of stromatolites revive so they could coexist together. And once conditions improved, this was a non-recoverable decline. So usually, this is where uh, metazoan evolution is placed. And that's usually because of this decline in stromatolites. People believe that this decline is not because there wasn't any stromatolites, it was because of the abundance or the availability of animals that compromised, because they were burrowing animals. So microbial mats were there, they just weren't preserved. But I think it's a bit more complex than that. I think we need to focus on this rise here, for something to have been outcompeted by complex organisms before, but something allowed that rise back up again, and I should remind you that this is almost as equal, uh, as high as the Archean times when there was no competition. So something must have happened at this point here where this was facilitated, and I think it was facilitated because of the rise of animals. And they realized that it was in their favor to have stromatolites around because of lack of oxygen. And once they diversified, yeah, this was non-recoverable. And there are papers out there that support this theory, and we've been doing de detailed statistical analyses as well uh, to show what elements were important and what not. And so, yeah, in three years' time, I, will, I shall let you know if, um, uh, if I have been able to publish anything. But I'm not afraid, and that's because the motivation of my PhD was this. I remember being handed a book by my supervisor saying, here's a book on pyrites, go read it. And this is one of the first things I came across. The trace element spectra of pyrites and sediments have been the subject of innumerable investigations with a view to using these as environmental indicators. Unfortunately, it is a common PhD topic suggestion and students are advised to steer well clear of accepting this subject for their PhD studies. The problems are discussed in chapter 13.7.8, which I never bothered to look into. And I remember going to Prof saying, what is this? Like, how are we going to deal with this? And well, we just had to deal with it. And so I'll leave you with this saying that I really, really like. The greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. Thank you. So where does this go next? Um, I, I was worried about the worried about the time, but really, there's there's a there's a paper that's so close to being submitted, and probably very close to being rejected straight away as well by people who think metazoans occurred in 800. But I think the next big challenge for us, or for me as a researcher, is is to establish this key rise here. Why, why we let my, uh, the stromatolite abundance recover. And that's because um, metazones evolved. And if, if that's true, then that changes a lot of our current understanding of how evolution has occurred through time. And it will also probably throw a lot of insights into what we can expect in terms of utilizing this information in, in predicting future trends as well. So we've got a lot of stromatolites today, in present day stromatolites, and they interact with the biosphere around them as well. So there's a tendency of looking at these things independently, or we'll just look at eukaryotes, we'll just look at stromatolites. I think we need to start looking at it holistically and to see if stromatolites have evolved 
in a certain way, how was the rest of the biosphere around the stromatolites um, behaving around it? And, you know, there's a lot of issues with fossil record because there might have been metazoans or organisms there, but they're not essentially preserved because their body parts were soft body parts and not hard body parts. And, but you can use these as proxies. You have to ask the question, why, when you've seen a significant decline of these abundances, why then, what, or what triggered the rise? So I think my, my next challenge for, for at least three or four years would be uh, to, to question that and in the process of upsetting a few people here. So that's something I'm looking forward to. Thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting and inspiring lecture, which I really appreciate. And I just had a question. When you, when you put this up, you're drawing the lines along the bottom of all these dots, not in the middle of them. So my first question is, there's obviously something I don't understand that's significant about the bottom. I'll just, I just can't, can't read with this. Um, that, that's uh, significant about the bottom. And then the other question I've got, at the beginning you talked about different cycles. And I'm an engineer, I understand that there are different cycles and you can do analysis. It almost looks like there's a higher frequency of, of cycles in that as well. Is that just random or is, it, is there other higher cycles? No, I, I think these uh, cycles here, for instance, can, oh, no, you can't see it. So there was no real reason. I just wanted to look, I just wanted to highlight the fact the lowest it's dropped. You can look at the means as well. So you could look at the means or the medians and would essentially give you the same answer as to something that was higher in the Archean times to uh, changing drastically, not so drastic in the Proterozoic here, but this is, I just wanted to show the lowest it ever got. But you could use the median or mean for that respect as well. These fluctuations are, I think they're very significant. We have to remember that this time was the advent. This is essentially, the, this bit here is, is the boring billion bit. And I think this was the time when, this is, you've got to look, look at it in a way that there's something that's been existing for billions of years, and now they are suddenly, they, they've got new members to the party, um, the eukaryotes, a complex organism. So there will have been, these ups and downs owing to their interactions at the time with this new community. And I very conveniently use the word eukaryotes. There are millions of species of eukaryotes and different types of prokaryotes as well. How these uh, different organism or the or com microbial communities interacted with one another is, is what that might have been uh, causing these uh, fluctuations here. And in our statistical analysis that I've just been doing um, with, with my co-author, you can see that all from, the, from 2,500 to about 1,300 here, the, the most important thing is the temperature. The temperature of the oceans were critical. It was only around 1,300 to 1,000 around this time here that you start seeing suddenly a lot of other elements became very significant, significant for the stromatolites in this instance. And so you, you see this data and you go, well, all this time they've managed with ups and downs, and I've just discussed how things have gone, nutrients have gone up and down, but it didn't seem to affect the stromatolites as much. This is also truly because of expanded eukaryotic diversification. But this rise here, that coincides with suddenly a, a lot of elements becoming very important to them, and that's probably because they're facing a lot of competition because of the biosphere around it. And so, and, and once the metazoans evolve, again, they will have had these different cycles, presumably because they're now interacting with different, different biological communities, very different to their, the cellular mechanism is very different to theirs. So the interactions will have been uh, interesting. And that's probably what's causing these ups and downs. How would the massive increase in carbon dioxide affect the growth or not of the stromatolites? 
That's a really interesting question. Uh, it depends because if you had if you had photosynthetic microbial mats, then they'd be very um, gladly using up the carbon dioxide and, and producing uh, O2. But it depends whether the microbial mat communities were oxygenic photosynthesizers or anoxygenic uh, photosynthesizers. Uh, carbon dioxide would also affect a lot of weathering rates, and so that would interfere with what sort of nutrients would have been um, transferred to the ocean. So in today's world, it's very oxygenated, and you have dominantly oxidative weathering occurring. In other words, utilizing oxygen for chemical weathering. But you could also have enhanced weathering due to increased levels of carbon dioxide as well. So that would, however, lead to a different set of weathering products and a different set of suite of nutrients. And so, yeah, you're, you're, altering, you're altering what you are introducing to our oceans in terms of nutrients or chemical elements. And so that's why the whole question of chemical evolution prior to biological evolution, what elements are available in our oceans for our organisms to, to evolve. So that would affect the stromat stromatolite abundance, but it would, we would then, then need to document what part of the microbial mat was um, uh, pursuing oxygenic photosynthesis versus anoxygenic photosynthesis. Thank you. When you showed the, uh, the uptick in the trace elements, were there any other, were there any significant events that happened at that time that you have to work around for that? So the uh, uptake in trace elements in this graph yeah. here? Yeah. yeah, so that's marked. Uh, sorry, your question was why? Are there any significant events that happened within the first Absolutely. I mean, that time is actually, um, that was the 1400 uh, million year oxygenation event. Now, usually people like to believe that oxygen increased and that must have caused an increase in biological um, organisms. But I think it's the other way around. I think the eukaryotes at the time diversified to a significant extent and they pursued oxygenic photosynthesis. They were oxygenic photosynthesizers. And because they uh, diversified, they caused an increase in the oxygen of the atmosphere, and that's actually an event now. It's the 1400 oxygenation event. It wasn't as high as the uh, the first or the or the second great oxidation event, as we call it, but it was a significant event in the sense that the oceans were experiencing a significant amount of oxygen, as well as the atmosphere, because the eukaryotes. Uh, the other significant thing that happened was they diversified in different habitats. These organisms were restricted in, in certain areas of the marine realm, but after following the low trace element period, they had diversified because they had adopted different mechanisms to cope with the stressful environment and had um, added evolutionary strengths to uh, the environmental conditions that they can withstand, and that allowed them to sort of diversify in, in a lot of habitat. So that happened as well. Uh, you, you see a lot of fossil discoveries during that period, and a uh, notable one is the, the first fungi, as well as uh, red algae. So there were lots of uh, biological events. Um, you know, you emphasize, and everybody knows how incredibly diverse life is. And yet, on the other hand, how incredibly interconnected life is in so many respects. And, uh, are we getting any closer to any sort of uh, how the actual origins of, we hear it sometimes said life might have occurred only perhaps once on life or whatever, and then have you any comments on that respect? You know what I mean? Yes, I was uh, very lucky to have uh, attended a, a, a conference that discussed just that. And so I... I don't know if I'm grateful or, or not, but I, I work on evolution of life, which is very different to the origins of life. Um, but I, I was fortunate to attend a conference, and there's significant debate on whether life originated in space 
or whether life first formed the depths of our oceans or first formed on land. And there are credible uh, evidence for all these three, these th three theories. But what I really think is important, and I, I actually like to brag about this, that geology uh, or, or geoscience is, is fundamental to understanding origins of life uh, if life evolved on Earth. If it's out of space, then yeah, I, I have no idea. But if it did evolve on, did originate on Earth, then you, it's a known fact that you needed a suite of elements, the, the, the pool of light, the primordial soup, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in order to create that, you need to have the right geological environment around it, you know, the right geochemistry. Um, and so to make those elements available, and not just available, but also react in a, in a certain way to form um, or environment conducive enough for a series of chemical reactions that will have first formed up the first cellular membrane, et cetera, et cetera. How it all happens is very intricate and complex, but you have to remember that the chemical origins of life the, or the chemical evolution prior to biological evolution is of utmost importance. And you have to have the right elements at the right time to form um, the right uh, soup for the first origins of life. And for that, you need to understand how the geology around the area uh, or, or the, what the environmental conditions, geo-environmental conditions might have been like in the past, but there's, uh, there's evidence in, in Australia at the Dresser Formation in, in the Pilbara, which uh, points to the fact that life originated 3.2 billion years ago, the first life form. But if you speak to researchers uh, elsewhere, they will have produced another evidence that's 3.7 billion. So everyone's uh, in, in this race. Uh, to our found the oldest evidence of life. But you, we can fight about dates. We love doing that. I mean, I'm doing that right now with my Metazone story. But what's important is to remember that if life did originate on Earth, then it, uh, having the right suite of elements uh, would have been critical. And for that, you need to have a good understanding of the geology around it. That includes plate tectonics and all sorts of other processes. I think uh, I think it's a it's a it's a time connotation. You, I think you I think that yes, it is a one-off event. I think definitely. I think you needed the the time. It's like a slow cooked meal. You just have to have the right ingredients, and then you put it in the oven. You just hope for the best. <laughs> Most of the time, it turns out to be quite all right. You showed us a, a beautiful. Um movie of symbiosis between a paramecium-like animal and algae. Do you think it's possible that that symbiosis went to um, the creation of the metazoa? Do you think we're descended from plants as well as animals? Yeah, uh, it's important because the symbiosis and these interactions, not just symbiosis, but even the pre predatory interactions, they have actually evolved um, multiple times. So that was, that's one example, that's not a one-off one -off event. And they have evolved, again, I keep coming back to the, the chemical environment. It's because, you know, I just talked about the nutrients or elements being available in the oceans. If an organism is floating around, they won't necessarily just tap that. It's not, it might not be chemically favorable. For them, it might be favorable to ingest another organism which has already got the cellular machinery to harness a certain element. So it's in my best interest to host you so I could get, I don't know, cobalt, nickel, whatever it is that you are capable of harnessing, so we can, um, we can mutually benefit from one another. And this has occurred multiple times. These interactions have changed uh, as biological communities have changed through time. And so I, it is definitely possible. Why not? But I, I, I don't, I'm not going to pretend I'm a biologist, though. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.
Thank you.